So uh, I've been at Microsoft Research for about 20 years. I think when I started, I was an inch taller. Uh, and uh, about five years ago, uh, well, uh, when I first came here, for the first 15 years, I worked in Redmond. And about five years ago, I moved our group down to Los Angeles. So this transition from uh, Seattle to Los Angeles is not what this talk is about. Rather, it's about how machine learning and big data are changing the face of biological sciences. In particular, uh, we all know that biolog biology needs the wet lab. We have your test tubes, your Bunsen burners, and much more sophisticated uh, instruments than that. But there is a trend, a growing trend, to more and more dry lab work or computational work. And in fact, it's now possible to take data off the shelf, data that was uh, generated months or years ago for some other purpose, and apply advanced machine learning techniques to that data to derive new biological insights, to actually make progress in biology. And that's what I'd like to talk about today. Uh, so you've already heard a lot about uh, big data. Uh, there's lots of data out there, both uh, on the business side, for example, the internet, and on uh, the scientific side. You, heard, you saw uh, the uh, example from astronomy. Uh, there's other uh, examples in healthcare, genomics, and so forth, which I'll talk about today. And actually, uh, there's a new source of big data that will hopefully come online soon. Uh, President Obama just announced a few weeks ago the Brain Activity Map Project, where the idea is to simultaneously record all or many of the neurons in the brain for a period of time, and then to analyze that data to try to figure out how the brain works. So that's, that's going to also generate a huge amount of data. And so uh, to this huge amount of data, we apply uh, sophisticated machine learning algorithms, uh, as you see here. And what I thought I'd do today is cover each one of these in, in great mathematical detail. Uh, OK, good. Um, uh, uh, really, uh, all I need to say about it, uh, Rick has already, already said it. There's a lot of good applications of machine learning and big data uh, in business, certainly here at Microsoft. These are just some examples. But today, I want to focus on the sciences, and in particular, uh, genomics. I'll give you five examples of how big data and machine learning are changing the face of uh, the practice of this science. The first two examples are more traditional interactions between wet lab and dry lab, where the, where the scientists get together, they make a hypothesis, they say, oh, we need this data. They go off and get this data, usually involving a wet lab. And then the dry lab folks come in, analyze that data, and the process iterates. But in the last three examples that I'll show you, it's strictly dry lab work. So this is data taken off the shelf, generated for some other purpose, then combined with machine learning to derive some new insights in biology. So before we get into that, let me just uh, uh, go over the uh, area of genomics a bit. There's certainly a, a revolution going on in genomics, and it's pretty clear what's driving that revolution. And that is the cost of sequencing DNA, human DNA, for example, is dropping extremely quickly, faster, much faster than Moore's law. So uh, a little over 10 years ago, it cost several billion dollars to sequence one human genome, the first human genome. And uh, any day now, we're going to see uh, the human genome sequence for a price of about $1,000 uh, per genome. And pretty soon after that, it's going to cost more to take your blood than it is going to be to uh, sequence your genome. So there's going to be an opportunity for everyone's genome to be available uh, for various applications that I'll talk about. Just to give you an idea of where we are in the near term, this device should be coming out soon. It's from Oxford Nanopore. Uh, yes, that is a USB plug there. The idea is you plug this into your computer, put a drop of blood in this port here, and soon DNA data starts spewing into your computer. Quite remarkable. OK, so uh, here's the, uh, let's, let's start with the first example of genomics. What do you do with this data? Well, one thing you can do is personalized medicine. And I actually, um, uh, in, a, in a, a life long ago, I was trained as an MD. And in that training, uh, what you learn are a set of rules that you're supposed to follow. 
So example rule, if a woman's over 40, or over 30 rather, she should have breast screenings, okay? Another rule, if you have seizures, you should take drugs for it, and one of the drugs uh, that you should, one of the drugs that's uh, recommended is Tegretol. Well, uh, that rule is uh, meant to be broken, and I'm gonna, about to show you a very graphic picture, so if you're queasy, look away for the next 30 seconds. But if you follow that rule, uh, in some circumstances, uh, this is what's going to happen to you. So these are people that had seizures, were given Tegretol, and unfortunately they had a particular generic variant, which when combined with taking that drug, caused this to happen. It's called Steven Johnson syndrome. Obviously, it's a very bad thing. You do not want this to happen to you. So with, with the advent of genomics, the genomics revolution, it's possible to avoid this thing this sort of thing from happening. And in fact, there are many uses of personalized medicine. You can use genetic markers to understand what the causes of disease are to hopefully derive a treatment or a cure. You can use genetic markers to diagnose a disease, to, uh, to uh, predict whether you're going to get a disease that, and, and what you might do to prevent getting that disease. Uh, and not only can you predict bad reactions to drugs, but you might predict favorable reactions to drugs so that people don't end up taking drugs uh, for no reason at all. All right, so how do you do all this? Well, one of the most common procedures for looking at relationships between your genome and some interesting trait, like whether you're going to get a disease or whether a drug will work well or badly for you, is called Genome-Wide Association Studies, or GWAS for short. So it's actually very simple in principle. Let's say you're interested in uh, what the genomic relationships are to a particular disease. Well, you gather a bunch of people that have that disease, and you gather a bunch of people that don't have that disease, and you sequence their DNA. Um, and uh, so what you, that, that's what's being shown here. Each row corresponds to a different individual, the DNA of a particular individual. These people are healthy. These people are sick. And the first thing you notice when you sequence DNA is that most of our DNA is the same. From one person to the next, it's all the same. And every so often you have a, a difference. Uh, the simplest difference is just a single nucleotide change, and we call these things SNPs for single nucleotide polymorphisms. So here's an example of a SNP. And uh, then you look at the SNP and you compare the SNP in people who are healthy and people who are sick. And sure enough, in this case, people who are sick have more Gs than Cs and people here uh, who are healthy have more C's than G's. So you found an association between the genome and the disease. Now this might not be causal. This might not be the thing that's actually causing uh, the disease. That, uh, assuming there is a genetic cause, that genetic ca cause could be somewhere else in the genome, but presumably pretty close to this thing because uh, uh, of the, uh, just by the physical proximity of this uh, association we found with the potential true cause. And I'll give you an example of that in a moment. So you do this now genome-wide. You don't just do it for a small bit of the DNA. You do this across the entire genome. And you get a plot like this. Uh, on the x-axis, you see the different chromosomes and the different positions along the chromosomes. And on the y-axis, you see how strong this association is between a SNP and uh, whether or not you have a disease or some other interesting trait. And you can see uh, most of the associations are fairly in the noise here, but every once in a while you have this peak, okay? And these peaks are presumably something interesting going on. It might not be causal, but uh, this SNP, for example, might be very close to something that is causal on the genome. And uh, for obvious reasons, we call these things Manhattan plots. Okay, so this has been done now for about a half a decade or uh, uh, half a dozen years, let's say. Uh, with great success, uh, what this is, each one of these bars here is one of your chromosomes, chromosome one, chromosome two, chromosome three, and so forth. And each colored dot represents a successful study where people have uh, found a trait of interest and found an association between that trait and this location on the genome. This slide is actually uh, quite old now. There's many, mo many more associations that are being found uh, at an exponentially growing rate. And let me give you an example of something that we've done here in collaboration with uh, uh, Brian Trainer at the NIH. Uh, we, were, he, we were interested in, in Lou Gehrig's disease, 
And Brian was able to find a cohort of people in Finland, about 500 of whom had Lou Gehrig's disease and 500 who were healthy, just as I was showing in that slide before. And we performed GWAS, looked at the Manhattan plot, and there was a spike, um, a very strong spike uh, near this uh, gene called C9ORF72. Uh, and uh, so Brian did a lot of work. He, he determined that that SNP turned out not to be the actual cause of Lou Gehrig's disease, but there was a, a genetic change very close to that SNP that was the cause. Uh, and it turns out to be a hexanucleotide repeat in this gene. And by that I mean you have six nucleotides with a particular pattern. I think the pattern was G, 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 C, C. Those six, six nucleotides, that pattern was repeated over and over again. And in people who had Lou Gehrig's disease, they had this hexanucleotide repeat. And people who didn't have Lou Gehrig's disease didn't have this repeat. So uh, Brian did some more work and discovered that about a third of all uh, inherited Lou Gehrig's disease in Europe was due to this, this hexanucleotide repeat. So this, this discovery now is in routine clinical use. If you have a history of Lou Gehrig's disease, uh, or you know, family history, uh, uh, the physician, a physician's going to recommend that you get tested for this genetic change. And so you can then make decisions, for example, about whether you want to have children. Another interesting thing happened uh, in this case, and that is as uh, Brian and his team started looking for other people who had this change, they discovered that some people who had this change, they weren't getting Lou Gehrig's disease, they were getting a different disease called frontotemporal dementia, which happens to be the second most common uh, cause of dementia. So this is an example where a single genetic cause can actually lead to what we call two different diseases. So in reality, they're not two different diseases. They have the same genetic cause. But because of environmental factors, that genetic cause can be manifested in different ways. So that, that was a very interesting finding in and of itself. And now uh, the status of this is that we're now, now that we know what the genetic cause is, we can try to figure out what the mechanism of that cause is, and that would hopefully lead to a uh, treatment for the unfortunate people that already have uh, ALS. Okay, so back to GWAS in general. Uh, much of the low-hanging fruit has been picked, the really strong signals. This work has been going on now for, as I said, about uh, six years or so. And so the remaining signals are weaker. Um, they're not unimportant, they're just weaker, and uh, to pick up these signals you need more data. Uh, so many groups have un, uh, realized this and are uh, going out to collect this data. Um, but when you, when you do this sort of analysis with a large amount of data, you can get into trouble. You get what's called confounding, which is your statistical algorithm says that you found something very interesting, but it turns out to be completely spurious. It's completely wrong. And this can happen because you have multiple ethnicities in your data or closely related individuals in your data. And actually, I can give you an example of how this happens. So let's consider a single position on the genome now. We're looking at just a single SNP. And let's suppose the values of that SNP can either be an A or a T. Those are the two possible nucleotides we see at that position. And suppose we're looking at a set of people who have a disease, the cases, and a set of people who don't have the disease, the controls. And you can see here. Uh, in this data, there's more A's than T's in the cases, and there's more T's than A's in the controls. So it looks like you have found some interesting association. But suppose this data comes from two different populations. You can think of it as two different ethnicities. So in this population, there's more A's than T's, and in this population, there's more T's than A's. And it just so happens that how, by, just by chance how we collected the data, uh, there's more of population one in the cases and more of population two in the controls. So given those two things, you get the data that's shown here. It looks like a real signal, but it's not. It's just due to this, this, these, uh, having these two different populations in the data. And the more data you collect to try to, to find these weaker signals in the data, uh, the more problems you're going to get like this. Now the good news is that animal breeders figured out this problem decades ago and they invented an algorithm uh, that can deal with it. They, uh, basically the algorithm can find these, these hidden confounders in the data and correct for them. It's called a linear mixed model. The bad news is this algorithm is extremely computationally intensive. 
So uh, if you are analyzing a data set with n people in it, it's going to cost you n cubed runtime to execute the algorithm and n squared memory use to execute the algorithm. So if you have a data set with, say, 5,000 or more people in it, forget it. You can't, you can't analyze uh, that data. So what we did was come along and figure out some algebraic manipulations involved with the statistical formulas, and we were able to make this algorithm linear both in runtime and memory use. Uh, the algorithm is called uh, FastLim for Factored Spectrally Transformed Linear Mixed Models. But uh, just between you and me, this also stands for FAST. Uh, so um, another interesting thing happened with when we developed this algorithm. Uh, to, to make it fast, we had to transform, process the data in a certain way. Uh, and it turned out by, and, and this way was non-traditional. And it turned out by doing this processing, this advanced processing, uh, we not only made the algorithm faster, but it was more accurate. So this is a very rare occurrence in computer science where you do something to an algorithm that makes it faster and it also makes it better. So we got very lucky in this case and we've published it, uh, uh, published various aspects of this algorithm now in various journals and, and you can go uh, read about it if you like in uh, uh, Nature Methods. Okay, another example uh, in uh, this interaction between uh, the wet lab and the dry lab in genomics uh, has to do with some work that we've done with HIV vaccine design. And here now we're going to look at the interaction between two genomes, the human genome and the HIV genome. All right, and to, to introduce this topic, I'm going to go back to the early days here at Microsoft uh, when we uh, invented, the, uh, invented a spam filter, content-based spam filter. This was back in 1997, long ago. Um, so we eventually released the spam filter in several of our products. And we had uh, an interesting battle ensued with the spammers. So uh, for example, our, our, the way our spam filter works is it takes uh, words and phrases from emails and identifies which words and fr uh, phrases are more likely to suggest that the email is spam versus normal mail. And so one of those words happens to be Viagra. And uh, so the spammers figured out that we were doing this, and they would change one of the A's in Viagra to an at sign. So a human would look at the message and say, oh, that's an advertisement for Viagra. But our spam filter wouldn't see the at sign and wouldn't see the word Viagra and miss it. So we said, OK, that's what they're doing. We'll now detect this uh, text that has the at sign in it. And the spammers would recognize that. And then they would put in a bitmap with the word Viagra in it. So our spam filters wouldn't see uh, the bitmap as, as the word Viagra. And then we recognize that. And we de would detect the bitmap and read the bitmap. And it went back and forth. And at one point, we said, let's, let's, uh, let's uh, step back here. And what, what kind of strategy can we use to get around this battle? And the strategy we came to was, well, what, what's, the, what's the weak link of the spammers? Let's go after that. And it's kind of obvious, spammers want to get money from you. So we started cataloging all the, uh, wet, the links that were in emails that would take you to a site where you would then, you know, they get your credit card or whatever. And uh, this proved to be very effective. So every time a new message came out, they might use one of these old links, and then we, we'd get them. Uh, so now let's think about HIV. Um, HIV is a virus. It gets inside of you. And the, one of the reasons it's so successful is that it mutates extremely a lot. Uh, it, uh, uh, basically, every time it copies itself, it makes a mistake. So it, it's, it's highly, it highly mutates. And uh, so what happens is HIV gets inside of you. Your immune system starts to attack it. And then it just changes a little bit. And now your immune system can't see it anymore. And then it, it, time has to pass before your immune system can get, can get used to this mutation. And it goes back and forth, just as we went back and forth with the spammers. So you might think, well, is there a weak link of HIV? Can we go after that weak link? And that's what we've been doing for the last few years in collaboration with uh, Bruce Walker at Harvard. 
So let me take you through this in a little bit more detail. So the hypothesis, there are certain parts of HIV that are critical as to its function. This yellow bar here is meant to represent the genome of HIV. It's about 9,000 nucleotides long. And these red bars represent the weak spots on HIV. If we could just make HIV mutate here, we could make it sick or weak, sick, weak, or die. All right. But what happens, we think, is when HIV gets inside of us, our immune system attacks at random points, often missing these, these weak points. And so what we want to do with a vaccine is to teach our immune system in advance where these weak spots are. So we, we show our immune system these small regions of HIV where the weak spots are. And then our immune system is now primed and ready to attack when HIV, should HIV uh, infect us. Okay, so this uh, seems like a good idea, and sure enough, we've, we are finding some weak spots in HIV, uh, but there's a catch, and that is we all have different immune systems, um, and that, those immune systems are, are controlled by our genetics. So if you think about it, that makes a lot of sense. Suppose we all had the same immune system, and suppose a virus came along that was capable of killing one of us then it would kill all of us. So it's good to have this, this differentiation between us in our immune systems. So that's a very good thing, but when it comes to building a vaccine, the problem is that different immune systems attack at different points. That, that goes for HIV, that goes for any virus. And so what we need to do is find enough vulnerable points on HIV so that many immune systems, or ideally all immune systems, can attack at those points. And so we thought, well, uh, there's only so many uh, single points of weakness. What about pair, paired points of weakness? Are there pairs of points that cause a weakness for the virus? And we think there are. And to illustrate that, let me bring up this visualization of uh, this is one of the proteins of HIV, OK, folded uh, in such a way this, you know, it folds to, to uh, and then its shape determines its function, or at least in part determines its function. And so when you, uh, each point here corresponds to a particular uh, amino acid. Uh, if that amino acid is forced to mutate by our immune system, it can change the function of this protein. And what we want to do is change the function of the protein, make it not work as well as it would normally work so that we can beat HIV. Uh, so these uh, two points here in green and red represent a potential two-point uh, two points of weakness, a paired weakness in HIV. Uh, what happens is if HIV were to mutate in just one point, it would presumably change its function and hopefully die. But what happens is HIV uh, undergoes a compensatory mutation. So if, if HIV is uh, forced to mutate here at the red spot, then uh, it will also mutate in, in short notice on the green spot compensate for the forced uh, change here, and it becomes healthy again, which is a bad thing. So what we want to do is identify these paired points and then make a vaccine that forces the virus to mutate at one and only one of these spots. So for example, you could make a vaccine that uh, forces the, uh, the virus to mutate here, but also forces the virus to not mutate here because you could direct the immune system against the amino acid that this, this particular amino acid would change to should it be forced to compensate. So that's the idea. There's lots more pairs than there are singletons. Uh, so that's what we're doing now. And uh, to do that, we're using uh, machine learning uh, with an algorithm called PhiloD. Uh, actually, you don't need to use machine learning. What you could do to identify these, these paired points is just draw blood from the same patient over and over again and watch HIV mutate uh, over time. Uh, that, that's the simple way to do it from a statistical standpoint. But of course, that's very cumbersome. And try to, try to get blood draws from the same person in a developing country. It's very difficult. So what you can do instead is take blood draws from a population of people and through some uh, machine learning techniques, infer what these uh, two, point, uh, two points of uh, uh, potential weakness are. And we do that uh, with, as I said, with this PhiloD algorithm. We published it in Science a few years back. And it turns out this algorithm is not only useful for that purpose, 
Uh, researchers found uses for it uh, in all sorts of other things. It's being used by dozens of research groups now. And in fact, one group at, also at Harvard uh, used phylo D to discover that there is another arm of the immune system uh, that we didn't know. Well, we knew that there was another arm of the immune system, but we didn't know that it was uh, uh, affecting HIV, that it was attacking HIV. And through the use of phylo D, they were able to discover that, uh, uh, that this other arm of the immune system called natural killer cells were attacking HIV. OK, so uh, now on to uh, three more examples where now you're going to see how you can take data off the shelf that was developed for some other purpose and use it to uh, gain some biological insight. Uh, but before I do that, two disclaimers. One, I am not claiming that you can do away with the wet lab. That's obviously not true. And second, I'm not claiming that you can take data off the shelf as a machine learning researcher and push a button and do biology. You need strong multidisciplinary research. You need to know the biology in addition to the machine learning in order to do this. OK, so first let's talk about the relationship between the genome and the epigenome. Uh, now, many, maybe some of you haven't heard about, the, uh, I'm sure you've all heard about the genome. Maybe you don't know about the epigenome. Well, uh, let me go back to my um, eighth grade biology class. And I remember very well my teacher explaining two different theories of evolution. One is Darwin's, and that is there's something inside of us that determines our traits, and that gets passed down from one generation to the other. And we now know that that something is the A, C, T's, and G's of, of DNA. Another theory was put forth by Lamarck, which said that the environment influences something that's inside of you, which then gets passed down to influence the traits of uh, your offspring. And the canonical example was the uh, giraffe who has to constantly uh, uh, reach to higher heights to get the, the remaining food off the tree. And that does something to the giraffe's genome, which then makes their offspring have longer necks. Well, I remember my biology teacher praising the work of Darwin and just completely ridiculing the work of Lamarck. You know, what a silly theory this is that the environment would affect something that you can pass down. Well, it turns out that Darwin was right, but also Lamarck was right as well. And uh, this thing that the environment influences is now called the epigenome. So it's not your A, C's, and T's, and G's. It's something else that happens, but then that can be passed down into your offspring. And uh, the, there's more and more work going on with this now. It's, it's a relatively recent development in biology. But we're beginning to understand the mechanisms of the epigenome, how these marks actually happen that can be passed down. Uh, the first example of this that was discovered is called DNA methylation. And what happens is somehow the environment influences uh, some changes that can be applied to the DNA. In particular, for, uh, I'll bring back some chemistry memories, memories for you. Uh, uh, a methyl group can be attached to either an A or a C nucleotide. Uh, that's why it's called methylation. Anyway, somehow that happens. And then that, that methylation can be passed down, and then that can uh, influence your traits. OK, so now that these sorts of things are being discovered, people want to know the details of these mechanisms. Exactly how does methylation influence the, your traits? How does the environment influence methylation? How is the genome involved in that influence? And uh, we realized that we could look at one of these questions with off-the-shelf data. There's actually a data set out there uh, on dbGaP um, uh, where there's, there's many, many terabytes, if not petabytes, of data now available. And it was data for a set of individuals where both the methylation status of an individual was known and the genomic status of the individual was known. Bo both uh, data sets were available. So we thought, oh, we can take this data and look for patterns between these two things. And sure enough, we found those patterns, uh, some patterns, some, some very interesting patterns, and we recently published that in uh, nucleic acids research. Now, I'm not going to take the time to go into that. They're very biological. Uh, if you're interested, though, come up afterwards, and I'll, I'll tell you what some of those insights were. Another example has to do with what's called drug repositioning. Now, um, I imagine, uh, let, let's consider these two drugs here, Viagra and Rogaine. Uh, unless you have a very good spam filter, you've probably heard of these two drugs. Um, 
it, but interestingly, these drugs were developed not for their current purposes. They were developed uh, with the intent of lowering your blood pressure. And so physicians uh, started giving these drugs to individuals to lower their blood pressure, and they saw these interesting side effects. Um, and of course, those side effects turned out to be so interesting that that's now the main use of this drug. Uh, it happens, at least in the United States, that when a drug is approved for a particular use by the FDA, it can be prescribed by physicians for other uses that have not been explicitly approved by the FDA. So if you're able to find another use for a drug that's already approved, that's, that's, that's a good thing. You can bypass a lot of the uh, machinery, the, the delays in getting the, the thing approved. It's known to be safe, and if you find another use for it that's effective, well, that's great. So that, that has opened up a new area of investigation in, uh, in uh, biology called drug repositioning, finding new uses for approved drugs. And this is an example uh, from, from a very, very, very clever fellow at Stanford named Atul Butte who recognized that he could take off-the-shelf data and make progress in determining what drugs could be repositioned. So he realized there's data out there describing gene expression for various diseases. So you have a set of individuals, they have a particular disease, and you look at how each of their genes is expressed, whether it's expressed more or less than for someone who doesn't have a disease. So there's that kind of data. And then there's similar data for drugs. So you take a bunch of people that have drugs, uh, are uh, taking a particular drug, and you can see how much their gene expression for each gene is higher or lower. And they thought, if we find a drug-disease combination such that if in the disease the expression is high, but the drug makes the expression lower, or vice versa, and you have this pattern fairly consistent across genes, then that drug may be a treatment for that disease. So they took this off-the-shelf data, ran the analysis, and sure enough, they found some interesting examples. Uh, as an, uh, for example, they found that cimetidine, which is developed for ulcers, is potentially useful in the treatment of a particular lung cancer, of all things. And they uh, actually went to the literature and found this obscure piece which said, oh yeah, that's actually true. So it's very reassuring that they were, were, were getting this result. And then they found some other examples that weren't in the literature. For example, uh, topiramate, uh, which is given for seizures, is potentially useful in the treatment of inflammatory bowel disease. So they're now following up on these leads. Uh, for example, this, uh, this uh, potential uh, use has been now validated in rodents. And so uh, it, there, it's very encouraging that this might actually be useful uh, in the treatment of uh, inflammatory bowel disease. OK, for the last project, uh, I'd like to talk about something we call Moondog. This is a project with Azure, which is Microsoft's uh, cloud platform, or cloud computing environment. Uh, there's a data set out there from the Wellcome Trust uh, that it's basically a GWAS data set. It covers seven common diseases, coronary artery disease, type 1 diabetes, type 2 diabetes, uh, Crohn's disease, and so forth. Seven very common diseases across 15,000 individuals, some of whom have the disease, some of them who don't. And people have been hammering on this data set quite a bit uh, and have found many interesting associations. But these associations have been a, between a single SNP and the disease. And we thought, well, we've got FastLim now. It's fast. And we've got Azure. We have uh, uh, tens of thousands of nodes at our disposal. We could look at pairs. So we could see how SNPs uh, are interacting, pairs of SNPs are interacting to cause a disease. So we did that. If you were to use a single machine to do it, it would take 1,000 years. But uh, with Azure, we did it in 13 days. And just as in the drug repositioning case, we found some interactions that were known in the literature. That was reassuring. But we found some interactions that were new. And here's one of them. Uh, this is an interaction between a SNP in this gene and a SNP in this gene. Very strong interaction. And what was interesting is that there were many interactions between this SNP and other SNPs and this SNP and other SNPs. So that, that was very interesting to us. We recently published it. And um, 
Well, there's a long way to go here from this result to clinical practice, but I think this is a good place to um, end the talk because this is par for the course for biology where when you go to answer a question, you get an answer, but you also get lots more questions. Uh, so we certainly have more questions here. Why is this interacting? How is, how is that knowledge going to help us uh, uh, make a potential uh, treatment for coronary artery disease? So again, we have a long way to go, but I hope I've convinced you that with, with, uh, with just taking off-the-shelf um, data and combining it with machine learning, you can, in some cases, make uh, progress in biology. So with that, I want to thank my coworkers, uh, Jonathan and Carl, who've done a lot of work with, uh, on the HIV project that I talked about, and uh, with Christoph Lippert, Jennifer Lisgarten, Bob Davison, and Carl Cady, all working on those other three projects that I talked about. So with that, thank you very much, and I'll take questions. Thank you.